Well, good evening, fellow heretics. Welcome to Nerds and Heresy. I'm your host, Captain Dadpool. As you can see, my co-host, Natty Knight, is not with us, but we might be joined later uh, by my linguist friend, Imus, who's been on the show before. But for now, uh, we've got our guest backstage, and let's bring him on. Hold on to your butts. All right, Dr. Daniel McClellan, how are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing wonderfully. How are you doing tonight? Doing doing good. Whoa, too much. Back it, up. <laughs> back it up. Pull it back. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, yeah, here we are. A lot of people were excited about this show. I was surprised. Yeah, that's wonderful. All the hype we got. Well, that's good. So, your book, Yahweh's Divine Images, A Cognitive Approach. So... I'm going to start by reading a quote from your book. Okay. Uh, that I think summarized the point, the purpose of the book really well. I think it was in, I can't remember what chapter it was in. Um, we do not just, we, we do no justice to the literature to impose on the text our own theologically and philosophically driven perspective, uh, pers prescriptives uh, regarding what the word deity uh, is allowed to mean. A clear understanding of how these entities fit into the conceptual category of deity from ancient Israel and Judah demands a careful interrogation of the conceptual structure that constitutes and shapes the category. And it is that interrogation that I now turn. So, yeah, your the purpose of your book is to take is to analyze how human beings, as I understood it, um, cognitively interact with the data that's available to them. Mm -hmm. And then use that to create a, th a theoretical framework that we can use to reconstruct to some extent um, their um, per perception of divine agency or how, or how they develop their ideas of divine agency. Is that, yeah. that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to, this, this all goes back to research I started uh, for my uh, whew, second master's degree, where I wanted to look at the origins of monotheism. And I kept coming back to the question of, well, what counts as a deity? What counts as a god? And I, I was just not satisfied with the scholarship that was out there. But I was researching cognitive linguistics. And I thought that this research into how humans create categories, learn categories, use categories could have a lot of potential for helping answer that question. So, so yeah, we have a lot of kind of built-in architecture in our cognition that helps, that interacts with the world around us to produce our perception of the world around us and our place in it. And so that contributes to the ways we think about deities. And there's, there's been a lot of research on how people today living um, informants conceptualize deity and the relationship of deity to humanity and the relationship of deity to the world around them. And I noticed that there hadn't been a ton of research that took those insights from the living informants and applied it to the ancient world and the Hebrew Bible. And I thought, wow, I think that would be, I think there's a lot to learn taking that that information and helping it to fill in a lot of the gaps in how we reconstruct ancient conceptualizations of deity. Because looking at the scholarship, there are just a bunch of assumptions about what deities are. And there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge uh, because a lot of the texts are leaving unsaid everything that didn't have to go said, everything that could be left unsaid. And so I... Um, I wrote my uh, second master's thesis and then my doctoral dissertation on, on variations on that theme. And so, yeah, instead of just using our own assumptions about what a deity, what a God is, I thought, let's use this to fill in the gaps, kind of like the frog DNA to fill in the dinosaur DNA in Jurassic Park and nice. see what comes out the other side. See if that tells us anything about... Or, or if that helps us reconstruct a conceptualization of deity that fits the data better that we find in the text. And I argue in my book, it absolutely fits the data, the theoretical model that I suggest we develop um, from that understanding of how concepts of deity are developed and how they interact with divine images. I suggest that actually reveals a lot 
about how ancient Israelites and Judahites interacted with divine images and even conceptualized things like the Torah, the, the text of the law itself as a divine image. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not a topic I'm super familiar with. I was, I was like, this is, I, there, there didn't seem like there's a whole lot of this kind of stuff out there. Not a ton. Um, um, so it was a really interesting uh, approach. And I, uh, by the way, before I forget, hi everybody in the chat. I'm, I'm really bad at saying hi to you guys at the beginning of the show. Uh, if y'all have any questions for Dan at any point, fire away. Um, I told Dan, if you see something that jumps out at him, go for it. If you want to send a super chat, um, even better, help me buy some Christmas presents. Uh, <laughs> Get somebody some medicine so they're they're not coughing yeah, in the background the whole time. Really to... <laughs> uh, real quick, we got uh, Imus is joining us. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. It's nice to formally meet you, Dan. Yeah, good to meet you too. What, what was your uh, your profession again? I myself. Uh, sure, sure. So I'm a speech language pathologist. Okay. I, yeah. I work with adults right now. I specialize in swallowing disorders, but my master's is in communication sciences and disorders. Oh, very cool. Yeah. yeah, she's she's a big big fan of your work as a fellow linguist. Oh well, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so where, where, where do you want to go from here? Um, oh, I see the comments now. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, no questions far away. Um, so we. Hi, Freya. <laughs> now, now that I'm, now that we're here, I was all like rehearsed and prepared. <laughs> <laughs> um, so most of what we we know a pretty good amount about. Mesopotamia and rituals they performed mm -hmm. in order to what you called um, an instill deity into various cultic objects. Yeah. Um, and then we, the, the, we don't have a lot of data between that and what we start getting the biblical text, you know, some archeological stuff. Yeah. Um, so there's like a gap, a gap we're talking that's missing. So, um, and you mentioned in your book that, uh, the way Israel is set up, like mimics the the tribes around them, and then they they mimic certain um, like uh, rituals to cleanse the temple mm -hmm. and yet instill deity into their own objects. How do you think Israel started as like a smaller, or most likely started as like a smaller subsect that grew, and then more villages started to pop up and grow, and eventually they overtook Canaan, right? Um, but before that, it was Mesopotamian, Canaanite uh, mythology. So how do you think they, I know the scholarship's all over on the place on this. Where do you, where do you think the, Israel's origins are? Do you think a, a, like, like a family was just like, you know, let's, walk, let's worship this God instead for a while, see what happens? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. And um, my my dissertation goes into a little more detail about it, but uh, because I, I kind of took the cognitive data on where we think deity concepts originate. So what actually um, builds up this concept till we get to the concept of a deity? And yeah, like like you said, the scholarship's all over the place. There's a lot we we don't really know about where Israel began, and we start with around 1208 BCE, Merneptah Stele, which mentions Israel, uses a determinative that doesn't have reference to a city, uh, but is a people determinative. So there's that's, an that's the first time that Israel and Canaan are referenced separately. Is that right? Uh, well, it's the first time Israel is referenced in any way that could plausibly okay. be tied to um, the Israel of the Bible. Because um, Israel it was a personal name known from uh, Ebla tab tablets from some Ugaritic texts. And so that, that name Israel has popped up before, but always as an individual's personal name. And so uh, the Merneptah Stele suggests that it's some kind of people group, either um, something that's not permanent, uh, something not associated with a, with a capital city or a central administration or a monarchy or a king or something like that. And so uh, uh, one theory is that Israel was the name of a, uh, a coalition 
that a group of tribes in order to try to um, fend off maybe pressure from from the outside, uh, whether from probably not from the Philistines, they're not around yet, but some of the other folks that are around the outside might be trying to encroach on their territory in the northern hill country. So they band together and this band become, is Israel. Uh, El, let El contend is, is more or less what the name Israel probably means. And so it probably has when these groups come together, they are probably devoted to the high deity El. And so that would be the same as, as many of the other um, groups around them. And so at some point, according to this one theory, and there are variations on this theory and there are entirely distinct theories, but at, at some point, this group became permanent and then began to develop new ways of thinking about themselves. Uh, and centuries later, this would um, be articulated in this concept of descent from a single ancestor, from Israel, the 12 tribes, all of this. But initially, those tribes were probably completely independent, unrelated tribal clans uh, that were a part of this, this coalition, this uh, affiliation of groups. And so Adonai um, is not even in the picture yet and probably doesn't um, come into the picture until around 1000 BCE. And that is when in the inscriptional data, we start to see um, personal names with Yahwistic theophoric elements, and they quickly eclipse the use of L theophoric elements in personal names. Uh, there's a great paper by Seth Sanders called When the Personal Became Political. Uh, that's a, a talk that tr makes uh, an argument for how um, the, um, what does he call it? Oh, shoot. Pantheon reduction, where all the different deities that would have been active within this, uh, for this uh, coalition kind of get reduced down to a, a single deity, Adonai, who would have been conflated with El. So I don't go into a great de great amount of detail in my book, but I've, I've argued uh, before that Adonai and El were distinct deities. And at some point, Adonai seems to be an outsider not native to this area, not native to the Northwest Semitic Pantheon. There are different arguments about where they're from. Um, Daniel Fleming's got a great book, Adonai Before Israel, Glimpses of History and a Divine Name. There's another, there's another one by uh, Robert Miller II, Adonai, Origin of a Desert God. So this book argues that um, Adonai comes from the Midianites, this book argues that it's probably not the Midianites. It's probably another group that was deeper into the Arabian Peninsula, probably a, uh, it was an ancestral deity, something like that. These people make their way to the hill country. Someone who is a devotee of Adonai may have acceded to the throne. And at that point, in order to consolidate rule, consolidate power, conflates El and Adonai, turns them into one single deity. Um, and I... I had a class on this last month where I said that probably the most successful um, marketing campaign that has ever existed in human history, because that <laughs> yeah. divine profile went on to become the, the guiding concept of deity for um, a, a large chunk of the world, probably the most influential uh, divine profile ever created. So I, I think Israel gets its beginnings from, different groups kind of coalescing around this identity as this, as this group known as Israel, most likely to try to fend off uh, pressure from, from the outside. Uh, their, their biggest cities are kind of around the border, the kind of Potemkin villages where they're trying to project strength and power, but they're really not nearly as powerful as, um, as they want folks to think they are. So I think that's probably somewhere in there is the answer to that question. There are a lot of different theories. Oh, are you getting swatted? No, that was my 13-year-old daughter just slamming the front door for some reason. <laughs> okay, that was terrifying. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, teenagers are pretty terrifying. Yeah, I know. She needs to leave me alone. Oh, um, <laughs> so, there are a lot of different theories about how this happened, but I think somewhere in those, there's probably kernels of truth in a lot of these different theories, but... That's probably where how um, it all came together, starting with L, and then this this uh, Johnny Come Lately deity uh, mm -hmm. kind of got glommed like on that. there and became Adonai Elohim, and and that deity became the the primary deity 
and then later on the only deity uh, for the nation of Israel slash Judah. And it gets more complex the more you go into that. But yeah. it looks like we had some uh, a handful of good questions. I want to address one that uh, that came up first. Sure. Um, would be curious to know Dan's opinion on Mesha Steely and Two Kings Two. Same event. I was going to get into that later, but we can do that now. So um, I don't think a lot of scholars would say we can confidently conclude that that what is mentioned in Two Kings Three is the same event that is referenced by Mesha and the Mesha inscription. It depends on where you date the Mesha inscription, but I do think that uh, the Mesha inscription. Uh, indicates that what is being described in Second Kings has there's a, a degree of historical accuracy. We have to take that seriously as as a text that's reflecting what was going on at the time. And so the Second Kings three, in my opinion, is describing historical events that were well enough known that the author had to include them, but they also had to come up with an excuse for how they lost. Because this coalition, this Edomite, Judahite, Israelite coalition has this promise from Adonai, this prophetic promise that they that Moab will be delivered into their hands. And it's not just that they're just two nations going to war. Uh, Moab had been a vassal of um, Israel, and they had thrown off that vassalage. And so that coalition was there to try to restore vassalage. In other words, put them back under their subjugation. And so for that promise to be that Moab will be delivered into their hands is a promise that they will be returned to vassalage. And so they're doing everything right uh, and until they get to the last city and they're about to take the city and the, uh, the king of Moab can't break through. So he takes his heir to the throne and sacrifices him on the city wall in view of everybody. And then it says there's, there's great wrath or fury or anger against Israel and they pack up and leave. And this is a very terse, very um, succinct kind of description of the end of this military campaign where they fail to return Moab to subjugation. And I think if anything, the Mesha Stila demonstrates that Moab was not returned to vassalage, that they had their, their independence. And they also were not you know, left desolate. Uh, the text probably goes overboard in describing how uh, much of a scorched earth policy they implemented in that campaign. <laughs> it probably wasn't nearly uh, like what they said, but Moab was, well, was independent. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I argue uh, briefly in the book, and, and there are a number of scholars who uh, argue the same. I would suggest it's probably the academic, the scholarly consensus that the only explanation for one, that the language that's being used, but two, the events that are being described at the end of chapter three is that the sacrifice, at least in the eyes of the author, worked and that the patron deity of Moab drove off the invading force and their, their deity that was, that was guiding them. In other words, Adonai went outside the boundaries of their purview. They were in another nation, so they were within the purview of, of another deity and uh and they got smacked down and had to had to scurry back to to their purview where they are sovereign they were in another deity's um property basically and so uh you have that that example where the author is almost embarrassed to tell the story and so tries to tell it in the in the quickest and most obscure way possible but there's not really another plausible reading um, uh, without having to make up details and say, well, if we imagine that this happened and if we imagine that that happened, then maybe this is what it's talking about. When the, the plain meaning of the text is just that they rationalized the coalition's loss as a product of, of uh, Moab's deity beating them. Um, and that was evidently less embarrassing than having to come up with some other explanation for how this coalition could have uh, been defeated. Yeah, and you so, can find the, uh, how was it, what you call it, the uh, punishment motif as a way of explaining this away or uh, justifying <laughs> that Yahweh was angry with him, so he kind of changed his mind about all that. 
Yeah, it's 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 not clear exactly. The, the author's kind of trying to split the difference because there's a little bit where, you know, the prophet, when they first call the prophet, and he's upset. He's like, oh, you guys are losers. Okay, I'm only doing this because my friend's here. Um, and so, which is kind of hedging a little bit, saying, okay, yeah, there was this prophecy, but they weren't happy about it. So, you know, it's it's easy to, to just sweep that under the rug. They're trying to have uh, their cake and eat it too. Right, right. So I, I think, uh, a while ago, I can have it too. <laughs> a while ago, I suggested that if you, you know, if your sanctuary or your divine image or your deity, um, you know, if you lose a battle or get conquered or something like that, you can rationalize it in a in a handful of different ways. But the two main ones are: our God is mad at us, or our God got defeated. Uh, and our God is mad at us is, is overwhelming the, overwhelmingly the most popular way to do it. But here it almost seems like they're kind of splitting the difference and being vague enough that you're left wondering what exactly went on. Yeah, they're trying to play both sides of the fence. Yeah. But thanks for the great question. I hope that answered it for you adequately enough. But, but yes, absolutely. According to the biblical authors, the, deity, the patron deities of the other nations were very much real. And, and in that time period, Adonai's purview was limited to Israel. It wasn't until the exile and after, um, and we see this kind of uh, affected in Psalm 82, that Adonai's authority, sovereignty gets extended over the whole earth. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. Um, <laughs> hold off on that thought. I'm going to get to some more of these questions. Okay. Um, when do you think Yahweh became more than a local deity? the Israelites. Kind of so ties I, into what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I think there, there are two different ways to think about that. Um, local deity, I think of as not a patron deity, like not a national deity, but like a tribal or an ancestral deity. So that's, I don't know if that's what they were talking about, but I can answer both questions. Um, and, and I think I've kind of addressed both of them to one degree already. Uh, Adonai was probably an ancestral deity. The, the personal deity of a, of a clan that was then brought into the Northern Hill Country and at somebody's accession to the throne, somebody becomes king and brings Adonai with them. And then it's with, at the merger with El, their conflation, that they are probably, you know, get called up to the bigs, so to speak. And now they are a patron deity rather than just a local ancestral deity. But I, I doubt that's what the question was addressing. But when it comes to extending the purview, um, Adonai's purview beyond the land of Israel, because in the pre-exilic period, Israel is Adonai's inheritance. That's what we see in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, where the nations are divided up according to the number of the children of God. And Adonai's portion is Jacob, Israel, the, his share of the inheritance or his allotted share. And so that means that's the extent of Adonai's purview. So Saul is pursuing David, trying to kill him. And he's pushed him to the boundaries of Israel. And he's about to push him beyond the boundaries of Israel. So we have this famous scene where David and Saul are on opposite ends of a valley yelling at each other. Yeah. And David says, you are forcing me out of uh, Adonai's inheritance, forcing me to worship other gods. The idea oh, being... that's right. The that's idea right. being yeah. you worship the deity who has sovereignty in the land where you are. And so if I'm outside of Israel, I'm no longer in Adonai's purview. I can't worship Adonai. And we see the same idea with Naaman. When he comes down uh, to be healed by uh, Elisha and uh, dips seven times in the Jordan, and then he says, now I know that there is no God except in Israel. And people have always interpreted that to mean there is no God except Israel's God. But that's not what he said. There's no God except in the land of Israel. And so he wants to worship Adonai after he has returned to Syria and when he is in his master's temple. And so how does he facilitate that? He takes two cartloads of Israelite soil with him. Mm -hmm. So I can't be in Israel, so I'm going to take a piece of Israel with me. And so I'm standing on Israelite soil. I am still within Adonai's purview. So we see this in, a, in reflected in a few different ways. Uh, but then the exile kind of puts the kibosh on that because now everybody's outside of the land of Israel. How are we worship? How are we going to worship our deity when we're way over here in Babylon? And we see this in the Psalms. Um, how can we sing the song of Adonai in a foreign land? 
And the answer is what we see in Psalm 82. Uh, God stands among the gods to judge, uh, you know, and talks about how they're all being unrighteous and they're uh, shows, showing favoritism to the wicked and, and neglecting the poor and the needy and all this. And I argue in a paper I published in the Journal of Biblical Literature a few years ago that this is a God's complaint, a lament, only instead of the psalmist complaining to God, it's God complaining to the other gods of the divine council. Oh. And the point is, the exile, um, the forced migration of, of Judahites into Babylon shook the foundations of cosmic order and justice. And that means the gods of the nations are derelict in their duty. They have uh, lost the plot. They are neglecting their duty to uphold cosmic order and justice. And so it says the foundations of the earth, earth are rocked. And so God is condemning them for this, uh, for this dereliction of duty, and so condemns them to basically mortality. You will die like men, you will fall like any prince. And then you have the psalmist come in. Now that the divine council has been deposed, these seats sit empty. The psalmist, psalmist says, Kuma Elohim, rise up, O God, and take over rule or rule all the earth, for you will inherit all nations. The idea being your inheritance has now grown by uh, you know however many nations there are because all the gods of the nations are now have now been condemned to mortality. You are responsible for ruling all nations. You have inherited all nations, and that's the universalization of Adonai. So that's the point at which Adonai goes from the God of Israel to God over all the earth, which is how the end of Psalm 83 refers to Adonai. They will know that your name is Adonai, that you are um, most high over all the earth. And so this is something that happens exilic, post-exilic period as a response to the inability to worship our deity outside of the nation of Israel. So if the question was intended to be, when did uh, Adonai become God over all the earth? I would suggest that that happens in the exilic, post-exilic period. And Psalm 82 is kind of the most, the clearest expression of, of that desire, that need, that rhetorical um, uh, kind of lever. The, um, the, the concept of, of national deity versus personal deity put, put a whole new understanding of um, 1 Kings 18. Uh, where Elijah is going against the prophets of Baal. Because, you know, go back to church, it's just like God's the most powerful. It's clearly so easy, right? That's why. But no, it's like they were, the prophets of Baal were trying to worship Baal in Yahweh's territory. That's why Elijah was like, oh, yeah, bring all your prophets. Bring them all. Bring, bring your best sacrifice. Yell louder. You jump jump higher. Yeah, you go, yeah. it's, it's not going to matter. Your, your God, this isn't your God's territory. Right. And that's so the contest is about to determine who is Ha Elohim, who is the deity um, in our territory, because they're both claiming to serve their to fill the same divine role. They're both claiming to be storm deities, which is yeah. a warrior deity, the deity over inclement weather, the deity over um, associated imagery and, and um, features of, of the natural world. And so that's why the contest is. Who can outstorm deity, the other storm deity, by sending down lightning to set this sacrifice on fire? So who can deploy the features of the storm and prove that they are Ha Elohim? And so uh, Baal is unable to do so. Adonai, uh, you know, they douse everything in water and Adonai sends down the, the lightning and it just torches everything and dries up all the water and, and everything's gone. And they, the people have to fall down and yell out, Adonai Hu Ha Elohim. Um, he is the God. Um, in other words, that's the storm deity in this region. So Baal has, you know, lost the contest there. But yeah, that's that's because these are two deities fighting for sovereignty in the same area. That's so interesting. Um, first super chat of night. Thank you, Justin Hodge. A little, little off topic here, but it's all right. <laughs> How confident I'll read that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written by hand or dictated by the actual original uh, disciples. <laughs> I could answer this one, but you want to say <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think most well, most critical scholars are confident that they were not 
um, and that they were probably originally written anonymously. And it was, but very quickly traditions developed about who wrote these gospels and those traditions were pretty unified. But the data that we have suggests that there was no attribution of authorship for almost a hundred years. Uh, and so there's no reason to think that uh, the authors that were ultimately assigned to these texts uh, had anything to do with them. Yeah, the, the first mention of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is by Irenaeus about the year 150, 160. Um, he says that at the time there's like 44 gospels, I think. And he's like, there can only be four, you guys. And he's like, because the wind blows in four different directions, there's... He goes on this long tangent. It's like there's yeah. four the, the rationale is, is like, questionable. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's nuts. Um, before that, uh, Justin Martyr, about 30 years prior, he, he quotes the Gospels uh, in like all of his letters, and he calls them the memoirs of the apostles. He never calls right. them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. Uh, yeah, Arnese is the very, very first one to attribute those yeah. names to them. And I, I think your name comes a, a little after that. I think about 150 is, is Papias. And and Papias says that there was um, there was something attributed to Matthew and something attributed to Mark, but the way he describes what is attributed to them doesn't really fit what we have right now. Yeah, like Matthew is in Hebrew, right? Right. Matthew was written in Hebrew and then translated into Greek. That's not the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and he talks about the Mark as a sayings gospel. That's not the gospel of Mark as we have it and um, doesn't reference uh, Luke or John at all. It'd be more and, like Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. And so that some scholars think maybe that was the reference to Thomas or some early iteration of, of a sayings gospel. It's such an area of contention, like on TikTok. It's like one of those like easy things people can pull out of their pocket. They're like, look, the gospels don't, collaborate with each other so they don't have to be false and i was like i think you're actually bolstering the opposite of your argument because if you you know the other person says hey we know eyewitness testimony isn't reliable and you know if you took four people and had them recount the same thing they wouldn't all line up and then you have these beautiful charts and graphs that show where all those things overlap and mm -hmm. you're 20 and 40 percent so i said that thing that actually bolsters the idea that they're all coming from the same viewpoint and not what the other person is arguing so it's kind of one of those things to like pull out of their pocket and like these kind of lazy comment arguments so yeah and and i think tiktok is is a fertile field for that kind of discussion because it's it's a lot it's a lot of folks who are not specialists in this who are not aware of the technic a lot of the technical discussion uh, but these are things that make kind of intuitive sense to us uh, if as, as long as we're kind of operating on a surface level and so that's exactly why I think that kind of stuff is popular on TikTok by the way, you're uh, you're right. Uh, Irenaeus is 185. I think I said 150, 160. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, Papias is right later. around 150, but yeah, Irenaeus is a little later. Um, Derek Mythvision in the house, amazing scholar. Dr. Collins yeah. said that today's video that most high gods are most likely even humans in the distant past. Most likely, never humans in the distant pass um i would say um scholarly debate here i'm for it <laughs> so so that's actually addressed in fleming's book where he goes into detail about this because i would agree that most high gods were likely never humans in the distant past but that doesn't necessarily what but i would say two things about that that doesn't necessarily mean that adonai was never an ancestral deity in the, the distant past. And, and Fleming has an argument about that, pointing out that, hey, some of the high deities in the Mesopotamian pantheon were local deities over cities or over clans that were probably developed from ancestral deities. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that in, in, in my book, I go into a lot more detail about how the concept of deities, including patron deities, is probably an elaboration on the cultic interaction with ancestors. And so while some patron deities who are patron deities over, over empires and things like that may not themselves have actually developed from ancestors uh, who are worshipped as ancestral deities, I think the concepts themselves build upon that foundation. So I think, and, and um, John J.J. J. Collins is uh, I assume that's that's who um, Derek's talking about. Yeah, 
uh, he's written a lot of great stuff about Didi at, at Qumran and, and things like that. Or there's another doctor. It could John have been C. Adela. Is it but, John C. Collins? Um, John, I, I don't know. J I, I've always called him JJ, not to his face. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> John oh, J. John Collins. J. Collins. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I assume that's who he's, who he's talking about. Um, so, but the idea that, that these patron deities over large empires were not humans, that's kind of conventional wisdom. So that's something that, that, um, uh, that most people would, would agree with. And I think is true to a degree, but doesn't necessarily mean that Adonai was not uh, initially a, a, an ancestral deity. And I think the step of uh, a king acceding to the throne, bringing this ancestral deity with him, and then conflating that ancestral deity with the high deity accounts for how that could have happened. So I don't I don't think the way that most patron deities get there necessarily has to govern how we reconstruct Adonai's route to getting there. I see that. Uh, we've got another super chat. Thank you again. Uh, beer experience. Like we were just talking. Why are some uh, people in the Bible hold yeah. God's inheritance? And who did God inherit from them? So that that's Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, one of my favorite texts in all the Hebrew Bible, where, um, again, it has Elyon likely represented in, in the initial composition of that text as distinct from and superior to Adonai, says that uh, when he divided up the, the boundaries of the earth, when he divided up the peoples, uh, it was according to the number of the children of God. And in most, trans well, not... Not anymore. Translations are starting to shift to um, what we now understand to be the original text. But traditionally, that verse ends according to the number of the children of Israel. Uh, but we know based on uh, reconstruction of the source text of the Septuagint and from a Dead Sea Scroll fragment, 4Q Deuteronomy J, that the text originally said according to the number of the children of God. And then it goes in and says, an Adonai's portion was Jacob, Israel was his allotted share. In other words, Elyon divides up the nations, gives a nation to each one of their offspring, each one of the 70 children of God, and Adonai gets Israel. And so Israel is Adonai's inheritance. And so that becomes a way to refer to their relationship. So the people of Israel are Adonai's inheritance. Now that as, uh, as we go through time and the understanding of Adonai's relationship to the nation uh, develops and changes, and as Adonai is universalized, that concept of Israel as Adonai's inheritance also needs to change in order to make sense, in order to fit within the new frameworks that are being developed. And so the concept of inheritance changes a little bit, starts off as, well, this was the nation that was given to Adonai by Adonai's father, uh, El Yon. Uh, and then we get this concept that, no, Adonai kept it for themselves. Uh, and yeah, there, there are a bunch of different ways that it's represented. And then uh, you have the concept of covenant, uh, everything that went on at Sinai, that's when Adonai and Israel became a unit, uh, a, a, an item. Uh, and so the notion of Israel as Adonai's inheritance through that lens is a little different. So, so it changes over time, but I would suggest it goes back to what we find in Deuteronomy 32.8. And then we have uh, Deuteronomy 4.19, where it's, it's a very similar verse, but it's more, like more up to, it's, it's updated. Like right. the, the earlier verse is probably much later. Right. Um, and it Where it, it, Go ahead. it flips things. So rather than the, the uh, nations being distributed to the gods, the gods are now distributed to the nations. And rather than El Yon distributing and Adonai receiving, El, uh, Adonai is the one distributing um, mm -hmm. to everybody else. So that is a later update that's supposed to help you kind of reinterpret what's going on in 32.8. Yeah. And that's, that's a good like place to... You know, exercise the purpose of your book is how 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 did you get from this to this? Uh, you see these two different passages. You you know which one probably comes before the other. So then you go go back and uh, sort of reverse engineer it and be like, how how did we get here? And then you go to the other texts and evidence to figure that out. 
Um, yeah, I got another super chat. Okay. I'm not going to ask y'all to stop sending me super chats, but I do have my own. <laughs> Fire away. Thank you, uh, Quiggle. Dr. Dan McClellan. Any thoughts on Dr. Michael Heiser's conceptualization of deity, divine counsel? He also reads Satan into Genesis 3. Oof, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> Nahash? Yeah, so um, Nahash, that's the Nahash. Um, Hebrew word for serpent. Uh, so Mike is, uh, I think, a, a wonderful evangelical scholar who has done a lot to help evangelicals become a little more comfortable with acknowledging the divine plurality that characterizes the Hebrew Bible, that there are other gods in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and his dissertation at um, um, University of, oh gosh, Mad University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, is a great dissertation that you can find online, uh, the Divine Council in uh, Second Temple Jewish um, literature. I forget the full title, but in the unseen realm, he develops a theoretical framework that deity is rep, uh, is a way to refer to the occupants of the spiritual unseen realm. And he and I have gone back and forth for a long time on whether or not the conceptualization of deity changed over time or whether it was always the same. And, and Mike develops the concept of Adonai as species unique. The idea being that Adonai is ontologically exclusive, unique, unlike any other deities. And this is a way to preserve. Stop it, you. <laughs> this is a way to preserve the notion of monotheism. If we conceptualize monotheism as not necessarily that there's only one God that exists, but that there is a God that exists in a completely unique and different and superior way from all the other deities, then we can still kind of call that monotheism. And he's got some some articles where he talks about how monotheism is, uh, you know, may not work as well as henotheism or monolatry or something else. But ultimately, it boils down to Adonai as species unique, which is something that I criticized in a paper I gave at a conference last, yeah, last month in um, in Denver, where I argued that folks are trying to read their own theological biases and preferences into the Bible by using these kind of binaries of monotheism and things like that as rhetorical shoehorns. If we accept this concept, it draws strict boundaries. And so we can use those boundaries to kind of wedge ideas into the Bible. So I'm critical of that. I think Mike has done a lot of good work, but the concept of deity that I develop in my book uh, is quite distinct from his uh, concept. And the notion of Adonai as species unique is not something that I think is articulated anywhere in the text. And, and in the book, I go to great lengths to show that Adonai is an elaboration on generic concepts of deity rather than some kind of revolutionary, new, distinct, exclusive concept of deity. Hmm. You're muted, Imus. Oh, are you talking? That sick, Odd, sick oddly, we but, can't uh, hear you, but there is some some repetitive. Pre appreciate the metronome. I'm <laughs> not going to start singing for you guys. <laughs> Still nothing. Oh, I didn't think that would work. I'm sure. It <laughs> maybe was me. No. Yeah, you're still getting nothing from you. <laughs> okay. I'll wait for her to... You didn't have to leave. <laughs> um, all right. The, another super chat. Thank you, Justin Hodges. A little off topic again. When did Christians start believing Jesus was God? The disciples believe he was. So, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a big question. And yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a really big one. Yeah, I've uh, I just picked up a new book by um, Michael Bird called Jesus Among the Gods, which is uh, addressing early Christology. There have been a handful of books that, that have kind of developed uh, an evangelical notion of Christology, and in and and actually, my book actually sets the stage to talk about how does, Jesus actually. could be conceptualized 
not necessarily as God, but as a divine image, as an entity that manifests God's presence and power, because the book is about how it is about the logic of divine images. What's going on intuitively when people are like, okay, that's how divine images work. And um, a way that I've used to talk about it is, um, is uh, headstones. If you go into a cemetery, people not uncommonly will interact with a headstone as if they're interacting with the deceased loved one, whether it's uh, dressing it, cleaning it, uh, giving it gifts, putting food down, uh, embracing it, talking to it. These are ways that the, reflect kind of this intuitive perception that in some sense the headstone is channeling or manifesting or acting as some kind of conduit for the agency, the presence of the deceased loved one. And uh, I show in the book an example of an ancient version of this the Katumua stele, where um, someone carved out a depiction of themselves, and there's an inscription um, that is prescribing when and what kinds of food offerings should be made. And it said, for my soul, which is in this stele, kind of making explicit the perception that this stele is inhabited by the individual soul. And I argue that this logic is the exact same logic as divine images that a divine image is a material um, piece of material media that manifests the presence, the power, the agency of the deity. (laughs) And in that sense, it can be both identified with as well as distinguished from the deity at the same time, depending on whatever is more useful or meaningful to the people doing the identifying. And so that logic, I argue, is underlying what's going on with divine images. It's what's going on with the angel of Adonai is what's going on with the perception that texts that bear the divine name can have divine power associated with them. And then at the very end suggests that this gives us a framework for thinking about how Jesus could be both identified with and distinguished from God with this perception that they, as a bearer of the divine name, that Jesus um, manifests God's presence, God's power, God's agency, but is not exactly the same as God. And I think it's probably after the New Testament was written, because you have different kind of understandings of how this is working. Mark presents kind of an adoptionist Christology that Christ became, uh, you know, this representative, this uh, divine participant uh, at the baptism. And that I I think in the original version of Luke is what you have going on, but then, are you back? I hope so. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I had to um, come and wriggle around with it. No, Sorry about that. I'm, I'm glad you got it working. You got a little pupper behind you there too, taking it yes. off on the bed. Huh? <laughs> that is Timber. <laughs> Timber. Good to meet you, Timber. Um, <laughs> and so in, in Matthew uh, and in the, the first part of Luke, you move Jesus's divination, divinization rather, back to his conception and birth. And then John moves it all the way back to uh, before the creation. So they, they have different approaches. And then once you complete the New Testament, now everybody who's looking at this as a single collection has to try to synthesize it all and has to try to come up with a way, a framework that can but account Warren, for a, um, a framework that can account for how all of these presentations of, Je- of Jesus can be kind of distilled down to one understanding. And I think that's when you bring in the philosophers and the apologists, mm. and that's when you have these concepts of ontology and being and usia and all that kind of stuff. And between the second and the fourth or fifth century, you get this working out of what we now know as the Trinity. And so I think you had the concept of Jesus as kind of a, a name-bearing divine representative who presents the deity, but it's not until between the second and fourth slash fifth centuries that you develop a, a framework for understanding Jesus as God. Yeah. We, we have a very black and white thinking about the concept of God here in our Western world In the ancient world uh, divinity was, it was a spectrum. You you could be born divine. You could, it could become divine after you die. You could become divine uh, during your life at some point, like Jesus baptism, for example, Um, you read Philippians chapter two, um, it says, 
Jesus who, who existed alongside God, but who was in the form of God, but was not God, but was with God in the beginning. And he humbled himself, stayed obedient until death. And then Jesus, or then God, elevated his name to a position that was equal with his. Right. So there's two gods there. In a yeah. Sense. And then, so with Philo, uh, you have him describing the Logos as a second God. And then even as late as Justin Martyr, you have Justin Martyr referring to Jesus as another God. And so yes. in this period, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. And I picked up uh, Paul Holloway's wonderful Hermeneia commentary on Philippians uh, because he makes the case that Paul is conceptualizing of Jesus as a name-bearing angel in the, the hymn in Philippians. And so I was like, oh, imagine that. Um, that's exactly what I'm suggesting is the conceptual template that is kind of governing how they're they're thinking about Jesus. So, so yeah. The, um, and then Bart Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God, has a great discussion about that as well. And then there's another scholar, uh, Michael Peppard, who wrote a book called The Son of God in the Roman World, which is a discussion of Mark and Christology that also talks about that spectrum um, and how it wasn't wasn't quite the binary that we tend to assume it is today. And that those dichotomies, those drawing of firm boundaries that facilitate a lot of these theories is precisely what I try to break down in my book by suggesting, hey, from an intuitive point of view, we don't really deal in boundaries. We deal in prototypes and conceptualization of similarity and things like that. And so the boundaries don't come into play. That's what I was trying to say earlier before I realized I was muted was that I think what makes both of your contents on TikTok so enjoyable and palatable for people who aren't experts in these fields is how you make the content digestible. Because one of the things I constantly run into if I'm on a live stream or something on TikTok is how um, everything in the Hebrew Bible gets written off as like a Christophany or like something that's, and and I, I urge people to, you know, why don't you try reading a rabbinical commentary on that or try to see the Hebrew Bible through a, a Jewish lens um, because it's almost like it was a Jewish book written for Jewish people. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. What, what, what a strange concept, you know? And, and yeah. I'm not saying not trying to, you know, create identity politics or, or say one is right or the other, but we can't just like retrospectively look back at the text and just be like, oh, that's Jesus. And, like just write yeah. it off. Everything can't be a Christophany. It's just not. Yeah, yeah. It's it's methodologically suspect and also supersessionist. Yes. Um, and yes, Jewish folks don't true. appreciate when you go in and say, oh, well, this is our book. This is all about Jesus. Yeah, that's, right. um, that's problematic. So it's got to be maddening for them. I appreciate you bringing it up too, because I often I'll jump on and be like, "Are you supersessionist?" Or you know, <laughs> "Oh, what are you a dispensationalist?" Like I start to kind of listen to this person start to kind of fire off these eschatological worldviews, and I'm like, "Wait a minute!" That like you're you're coming from a bias, and I don't think you're allowing another viewpoint to like enter the chat, so to speak, because yeah. we have this like preconceived notion of what it should be because we've read Jesus into like every. Say I did a I did a live stream a couple months ago on Judges 19. And I had a Christian somehow read Jesus into that. And I was like, we got to, this is going to stop. <laughs> I draw a line somewhere and Judges 19 yeah, yeah. draw a line. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a, there's a tendency to try to, well, one of the ways that the Bible is so, one of the reasons that it is so dynamic uh, for so many folks is because there are enough vagaries and there is enough use of figurative language and symbols and stuff like that, that you can find ways to, interpret things as symbolic as figurative as as metaphorical and I, and that it's almost like a hobby for people to come up with new ways to reread what's going on yeah. and and one of the preferred targets is always to reread it as as christ and i've i've spent a lot of time responding to folks who are like look if you look at the first word in the hebrew bible at bereshit, sheet you look at the bait and this means this and the resh means this and it's all about jesus and and that's very creative yes and has yeah. nothing at all to do with what anyone within a thousand years of that text wanted it to mean so how was it when they're when they're like adam translates oh, to yeah. jesus jesus yeah. saved us forever or something like that like <laughs> yeah, you have to yeah. cherry pick it's each you're committing yeah. a text to sharpshooter in each one of those letters to make yeah. it say oh, that. The out of like the cabal. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah. where did you Google that? <laughs> like, just, 
I, I really, I'm just laughing at the comments here because someone said that you are their dad. And someone's like, your dad's awesome. He was like, regrettably, he is not actually my dad. <laughs> <laughs> he said, just like, tragically, tragically, Dan is not my dad. Dan is not my dad. <laughs> and someone said that they like my earrings. Thank well, you. It's Haku's dragon form from Spirited Away. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. And... Yeah. Oh, we have I another have, year super, super. I have some of the best commenters in our in our, our little community we have on the show, and I love you guys. <laughs> I you know, like the book Tetris that he's got going on. Your book Tetris. Oh yeah, behind you. Oh yeah, yeah. I I gotta have quick access to my stuff. So um, these this is a an ever evolving stack of of whatever I'm working on right now. Uh, but oh, I I picked this oh, one. Mine are this right is, above my monitor. You can't see him, but there's yeah. probably like thirty or thirty books or so. This is um, an interesting book that I just picked up, The Origins of Judaism by Yonatan Adler, which is going to make the case that um, that the Torah was not kind of a, a, a guiding principle within developing Judaism until probably around the second century BCE, second or third century BCE. So it, it kind of, really? yeah, it kind that of... Late. Uh, I, as I understand it, that's the argument that's going to be made okay. here. We don't we don't see like avoidance of pork be becoming very widespread until around that time period. We don't see um, awareness of an implementation of a lot of the prescriptions that are um, articulated in the Torah um, popping up in the material record until around that time. So I, oh, I yeah. have not started it yet. So I'm you know don't take my word for it, but I'm. I'm from what I understand, that's the case that's going to be made. Yeah, someone okay. had been making these these comments the other day that I was trying to go back and forth with them, and then it sort of like dissolved. That there was, he was saying, "Oh, well, the Sadducees and the Pharisees made up a bunch of rules." And I was like, "No, I think the six hundred and thirteen mitzvahs that are you know identified have a scripture that's attached to them." So that's interesting that you're bringing that up. And then I was thinking, I so said, "I think you're conflating that with like the additional tractates that come later, like in the." the Mishnah and the Madrash. Um, but um, he was like, no, that's the tradition. And I was like, I'm not familiar. I grew, I was raised Catholic. So I'm not familiar with this idea that somehow the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees um, invented mitzvahs. Uh, it's I, it's I not that they... I don't know where that comes from. I'm, I'm kind of curious. It's not that they invented it. It's like they, they made rules around the rules to like make an extra layer of protection to make sure you didn't. So like... Don't don't work on the Sabbath, right? Well, they would come around and say, "Don't spit on the ground either during the Sabbath because you spit on the ground. Okay. That's churning the earth, and that could be considered work. So don't don't spit uh, on the ground." Some of these little, um, yeah, like rules around the rules, kind of. Luckily, there was a rabbi in there that says it, some people are just bored. <laughs> to do, and that's what they did. They made extra rules, and I was like, "Yeah, but that's not what this person's identifying. They're trying to say that all of these these rules that Orthodox." Even in modernity, Orthodox Judaism is, is following, and we acknowledge that some of those things, we, it's not possible to follow them, right? Like, you know, when we must slay the Amalekites, we can't do that in modernity, right? Um, but I was sort of like, where, where does this tradition come from? I'm not, I'd never heard that. That was kind of bizarre. And, and there's, a, there's a tradition of that in early Christianity as well. For instance, uh, one of the things that, you know, in the second century, you have this debate about, are we keeping the Hebrew Bible? Are we getting rid of it with Marcion? ultimately they settle on keeping it and then it's like great we're keeping it what do we do with it what's the relevance of it and you get origin is going into a lot of that in the in the third century and i think there's this great discussion about uh that imprecatory psalm you know um happy um ashre are those who who smash the the heads of the little ones on the rocks and origins like so the little ones are sins and so we have to smash the sins on the rocks of Jesus. And so, um, and and you know, they're developing these uh, these different ways to approach the text, where there are four different levels of meaning in the text: the historical, the anagogic, the moral, and, and all these different things. So that's not that's not unique to um, to rabbinic literature by any stretch of the imagination. And, and people could say, well, they're making that up as as well. But really, all it is is their way to renegotiate their relationship to the text and the significance of the text within their tradition, which is something that everybody who wants to treat it as uh, authoritative has to do. Mm -hmm. That's another popular one, Psalms 137.9. They like to pull yeah. it yeah. Yeah, out as well. Um, uh, real section. quick, huge thank you to Wintershins for the very generous... Oh, wow. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to use that to replace the monitor that my cat broke. 
<laughs> Normally, I have I have a good size monitor as my main monitor, and then a little one off to the side. The big one fell and is broken, so now I'm using the little monitor. Uh, yeah, I saw the fauna sort of leaping into the screen earlier when the cat yeah, appeared. Yeah, the dog one, yeah. <laughs> he jumped up and like dug his claws into my knees. Like ah, I try not to scream in the microphone. So uh, there's a, an interesting um, comment just popped up by um, Prototype Sky. I always thought the Torah observance started during the religious consolidation during Josiah. So the Torah didn't exist during uh, the reign of Josiah. Um, in fact, Josiah is probably responsible for starting the first initial pieces of Deuteronomy. And most of uh, Torah would... Deuteronomical reform, right? Um, Deuteronomic reform, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Deuterocanonical would refer to the canon. But, um, and so it wasn't, and then later on you had the priestly literature and then you have a bunch of post-P developments as well. And so the Torah comes together between probably around the time of Josiah and then, you know, the second, third century, depending on, you know, the case that, that Adler makes. But... Uh, yeah, it's it's coming together very slowly. And I think the first time the text actually tries to represent the Torah as something authoritative and and unified and complete is uh, is Ezra, is the reading of the Torah to um, early Judaism outside the temple. Um, so, yeah, that's um, thanks for that question that um, allows us to clarify a little bit of what what's going on. However, all of these stories were probably written much later and projected backwards in time to suggest that this is the way it was earlier rather than this is the way we want you to think of it now. And so the observance, the widespread observance of the You're Torah right. probably comes from much later. Speaking of Ezra, um, a lot of people are familiar with Age B Bible, which is Dr. Aaron Hagashi, and that is what his dissertation was about. So that should be available now to read about marginalized groups mm -hmm. in the context of Ezra. Um, I mean, I was interested in that. It was and that was, was he was doing um, womanist uh, readings, wasn't he? Yeah. Yes. So some of it is about that. Yeah. Some of it is about, okay. Yeah. yeah. ET pulls a lot from like sort of like feminist viewpoints and theology and very interesting source for that. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to read that. recently for uh, not identifying your <laughs> viewpoints in online that was a oh. <laughs> choice because he has and now people try to fight him in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I, I think I, I caught a, a little piece of that uh discussion. I was in a hurry, I didn't get to watch the whole video, but um but yeah, I've been I've been online for a long time <laughs> and I learned a long time ago set boundaries. Um because right. it just descends into what the comment section wants it to descend into if you don't right. have if you don't have strong boundaries. Yeah. Oh. yeah, that's definitely good advice for anyone because a lot of people in the comments like are also content creators that I'm aware of and I've been asked to come on certain things or be involved in certain things and I say I don't discuss that in an online platform. I don't discuss that in a way that can be recorded and played back because um, I value my privacy and that's just not something I'm willing to share. So that's definitely good advice to put up boundaries when you're online because it's forever and people can pull it up and and try to twist you and your words and things. I also no. people are getting a kick out of the fact that you said pupper when you saw my dog. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I've been online for a long time. So I've got, and I've got a 13 year old. So oh, I yeah. have to, I have to be, um, I have to stay informed about the, the jargon, the lingo, the parlance of our times, if you will. Jeff is not um, a content creator. Do not, do not watch his content. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a here's an interesting question, uh, Dan. Are there any docs from the first, second, or third centuries that say the text titled Matthew, Mar or Mark, Luke, Matthew, or John authors are unknown? Any data to indicate who authored them? Uh, okay. There, there have been a lot of th theories and traditions about who authored them, um, but. I don't think anything that really stands up to much scrutiny. We do not have manuscripts that attribute them to anyone other than the traditional authorship, but there are some indications that the attribution of authorship in our earliest manuscripts were not original to the manuscript. Well, were not original to the gospels, but are things that were added to 
later editions of the manuscripts. And for instance, we don't always see the attribution of authorship in the same place, and it doesn't always, it's not always written the way, the same way. So you may have it at the end of a gospel, you may have it at the beginning of the gospel. It may just say the name John, it may say gospel according to John, it may just say according to John. And that variability is suggestive of something that has not been inherited, but is something that is being um, put onto the text by the scribe. Because if you inherit it, if you get the text that already has this title, you're just going to leave it where it is. But if you get a text and you say, oh, this is John's text. Okay, I'll write John there. But the, the person down the street may write it at the end or may write it differently. And so the variability in the attribution of authorship is one indicator that that attribution is being added to the manuscripts rather than something that is uh, innate native to the manuscripts themselves. But we do not have any early manuscripts that have any other attribution of authorship. Yeah, when you, when you, when you, oh, write, a, when you write a letter in the ancient world, look, look at how how Paul starts his letters. I, Paul, a disciple of Jesus Christ and writing to you, the, uh, the Corinthian church, whatever, that, that's typically how letters are started, more or less. Um, you don't see that. It, it, Matthew is not like I, Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, who was a former tax collector. Um, and if you were someone of no, who had a note, a reputation, like if you, like Paul being a former Pharisee, he had authority. Uh, people knew who he was. He could put, attach that to his name and write letters attaching his name to him, and people would take them seriously. If Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. He would have attached his name to it like that. Uh, but people, oftentimes, a lot of the texts in the ancient world are that are written anonymously are done so because they're not written by anyone of any particular noteworthiness. And this would mean that, so if, if you're someone who, that nobody knows of, your book would be more it has a better chance of being successful if you left it anonymous. Yeah. Then if you once you put it. your name on it, you're trying to suggest that your name means something to the to the text, and and right. none of these people the, the their names don't mean anything to um, to the text. Uh, interesting question here from Jimmy. What sort of music did the previous like Israelites listen to? Uh, was it sacred and is so was all the Yahweh or other gods was, or was there anything secular? You kind of touch on this a little bit when it comes to like um, images and uh, jewelry and like the, like the arts or. Yeah. So there's um, there was definitely music anciently, and one of my um, there was different kinds of music. It would not be recognizable to many of us today as, as music as we understand it. But that but that's true of a lot of different places. I've I've worked in some music translation. And like in Vietnam, you don't rhyme the syllables, you rhyme the tones, which is a completely different experience of of music. And so anciently music is going to be a lot different, but they had a lot of different kinds of musical instruments and uh one of the things that's interesting is um, Psalm 29 is a hymn that praises Adonai according to a bunch of features of, of standard storm god imagery. Uh, the sevenfold, the voice of Adonai does all these things, and it's all about lightning and thunder and, and violent weather. Shakes the cedars of Lebanon, makes the calves to skip, does all these things. But this, the places that are mentioned are all found in... Um, the north in Lebanon, in Phoenicia, which is where Baal was the storm deity, not Adonai. And so a lot of uh, scholars suggest that this was a hymn that was originally sung for Baal and that somebody yoinked it and wrote Adonai down uh, instead. As a is way that a to... scholarly term, yoink? <laughs> well, we use five finger discount as well, but, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> April 26, 1992. Um, that's uh, that's going deep into uh, that's a deep cut. But anyway, the uh, that would have been a, a hymn that would have been sung initially for Ball and then taken over, appropriated by Adonai. Uh, music in pre-exilic Israel may have been used in the temple quite a bit. In fact, there there is a theory that uh, you would have to sing in order to be um, uh, allowed into the temple, or at least be able to recite certain um, poetic lines or things like that uh, as a sort of um, 
demonstration that you are initiated, that you have the, the proper knowledge. But I'm not an expert on music in the ancient Near East, but there is a lot of research on that. And there are even reconstructions of what ancient Babylonian music may have sounded like based on um, reconstructions of their instruments and even some of the musical annotations that have been discovered. So that stuff is out there. I'm not the one to go to for that information, though. Or you can just watch the movie uh, The Prince of Egypt. It's all there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Whitney Houston was <laughs> Sorry, big. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, back then. <laughs> There's a really yeah. funny TikTok that went viral, and I can't remember the content creator's name. If someone knows, please comment it. And it was like he was posing as if he was sort of like coming from like a puritanical Christian viewpoint. <laughs> No drinking and partying, that's bad. Then he like cuts to him dressed as Jesus, and it's like literally Jesus in the Bible at a wedding, and he's like doing Dobke. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's like a big like music joke that I thought was like really funny. Um, <laughs> and uh, Jeff just said, "What kind of unicorns existed in the Bible? Rhinos are mythical." Um, I made a joke about this recently, where it's someone a scribe doing Job, and he's like, "I don't know what to write," and he's like do unicorns girls love unicorns and then it hands them an oryx like figurine because in modernity rem i believe is the word in hebrew um means oryx but it, it may be probably like wild ox but it means like somewhere along the line someone took the linguistic liberties to say unicorn I, i'm not yeah. sure you more information about that than me but i made this kind of like linguistic joke about that recently yeah the job's job's full of jokes um <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite is uh um where they have uh the whole book of Job can basically be summarized with God saying, how dare you speak that way to the inventor of the hippopotamus? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that that's um, that's an interesting question. I saw a video on that uh, the other day and saved it. And I've been meaning to do a, a TikTok response to it, but I haven't gotten around to it. And the, the suggestion was basically that unicorn is not a reference to a mythical creature, but just a reference to a rhinoceros. And, you know, we just screwed it up over time. And that's not accurate. It is a mythical creature because you don't get the concept of unicorn until you get to the Septuagint and where they use unicorn. By this time, the tradition from the Indus Valley and from India, there had been um, Greek, not anthropologists, but kind of natural scientists to the degree that they existed in the fifth and fourth centuries BCE, had brought back from India this tradition that there was a an animal that was bigger than a horse that had a, a horn that was about a meter long that was like white at the top red in the middle black at the bottom and had different descriptions of of its shape and everything like that and there's a kind of a related concept that we might see in persia at the time period uh and so what the septuagint translator is doing is misunderstanding what Ra'em is and not knowing how to translate that right. and reading in this mythical creature that they heard about from, you know, from India. And so uh, the, when it gets into the Vulgate, they, um, they use a word that can also, uh, or later developed associations with the concept of the rhinoceros. So no, it's not a perfectly natural animal that was never mythical. It was absolutely mythical when it was first translated into the Septuagint, which is where the Vulgate gets it from. So it was not originally a reference to a rhinoceros. I think we had another, yeah. Another super chat. Thank you, uh, Dan Gonzalez. Uh, is it just me or is the majority of, of the Septuagint a story of how the cults of El and Yahweh were struggling for domin dominance over the Semitic people? The Septuagint specifically? That's um, yeah. the majority of the Septuagint. So by the time of the Septuagint, El and Adonai are, are conflated. They're one deity. Uh, and unless, just, unless he's just using that interchangeably as to mean the Hebrew Bible? Uh, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, it, I would suggest that it is a story about how God facilitates, God El slash Adonai, facilitates is the maintenance of the integrity of Israel slash Judah as an ethnic group. Uh, because they are always being put upon by larger empires, and they are struggling to try to maintain their, their unity, their integrity as an ethnic group, and not get integrated into these broader empires and the deity is kind of the main facilitator of that so this is where the jealousy comes from the idea of a jealous god because 
once the Israelites Judahites start worshiping other deities before long, they've just been dissolved into the nations around them. And so to maintain their integrity, they need to only worship that one God. So that God is a jealous God. You're not allowed to go worship the other deities. We're not strong enough. We're not big enough to be able to weather that. Uh, and then they get in the exile. And now the problem is even bigger because we're not in our own land. We are stuck right in the middle of Babylon. And so hardcore, don't deal with idols. Don't worship other deities. It's only Adonai. And now we're universalizing Adonai. Adonai is bigger and better than all of them. So I, I think there is something to that idea that, and not just the Semitic peoples, but all the people around them, that the story of the Hebrew Bible is the one uh, is one of using the concept of God to maintain the integrity and the boundaries of a people known as Israel or Judah or Judahites or Jewish folks. And I'm working on a book right now that'll be a little more popularly oriented where I'm going to talk about the development of the conceptualization of deity through the lens of social memory, where I will show that it is when there are big changes and elaborations and developments and innovations, it's primarily to respond to those pressures in order to maintain the integrity of that ethnic group. That sounds good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. Since we're, since we're in the Hebrew Bible, I have one question. Yeah. Um, it's a little off topic, but we kind of touched on this uh, during your live, Captain, and, we, and I said, I'll ask Dan. <laughs> so, no. so Genesis 5, 2, man and female, he created them. Is that a merism? Um, I've, I've heard that a lot. Like I've, I've said a couple of times and I, and I, I don't think we're in, yeah, that, that's five, two. Um, I'm not convinced it's a merism. Okay. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible, but let me take a look at it real quick. Um, I, pr I appreciate looking at yeah. this. Because I, yeah, you're I, asking me. I was like, I need it. I need time to think about that one. This is <laughs> out of my wheelhouse. I don't know. <laughs> I hear a lot of like um, interesting apologetics around sort of like the Bible and the LGBTQIA plus community. Yeah. Yeah, and this sort of this kind of came up where it, they'll they'll reference Genesis five two to be like, there is a man and a woman, there's nothing in between. And I was like, look, I kept looking every time I saw this comment come up or in a video and I was like, well, what if it's a merism? Because then that would encompass everything in between, right? Yeah. Um, and, so I, and I've really seen that, that seen that a handful of times as, as a means of, of addressing the spectrum of, um, of sexual identity. Uh, and I think there's, I think as a renegotiation, as a like a theological renegotiation of the text, as a way to look at it theologically, I think that's that's great. Mm -hmm. To suggest that's what the original author intended, I'm like ninety percent convinced that's probably not what was intended. But there is an argument to make that the concept of the original creation of humanity was as a single individual that then gets split into mm -hmm. male and female. So the idea of of, uh, of Adam's rib, um, the word there is just one of Adam's sides. And so, uh, and there's an, a, a tradition that I don't know exactly how far go, back it goes, but it goes back pretty far yeah. that that was the case, that you had this, this individual that contained the male and the female and was then split apart into the two separate sexes. Uh, and there are traditions that have... Um, kind of a more of a spectral um, orientation when it comes to um, sexual identity. So uh, that's not, but yeah, I, I don't know that there's an argument to make that that was intended to be a merism. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so, I wish I could have been more helpful. There. No, no, that's <laughs> very helpful because it was, it's like, it just kept coming up and cause I, I primarily like take a, a specific verse and I try to talk about like the linguistics and not that I'm an expert in Greek or Hebrew by any means, but I explain that I, I try to teach people how language works. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, 
it, it could be mirrorism, but I want to ask somebody who really knows the language because I don't want to, I don't want to insert, you know, that. And I didn't know how to answer no. that question. So I said, let me ask somebody who would know. Um, and, and I think we probably have other mirrorisms in, in early Genesis stories. Heaven and earth is, I would sure. argue is a mirrorism. Good and evil is probably a mirrorism. So it's not out of the question. Um, but I, I don't know that we have enough um, information to say, yeah, that's, that's definitely what what was intended or even likely what was intended um and in the context of like someone was saying that i guess there's certain um within judaism like some people say oh well there's six different types of of gender and i was like kind of going back saying my understanding is those are like legal classifications like what do we say this is in, in this context because there's all those commentaries about something specific happens and then we go down this rabbit hole of law right, and right. what does that mean legally um yeah so I was like, let's not conflate the two things. Let's make sure, <laughs> you know. Uh, fun, <laughs> fun time, fun time, super chat. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the MCU claiming they are based in Earth 616, same as the comics? <laughs> um, I don't know that there's any data that uh, indicate that. <laughs> oh, no, I um, people always bring up 616 whenever I do a video on 666. The, yeah. the alternative uh, number of the beast uh, based on whether you spell out Nero's name um, or, or yeah, um, or um, Neron Kaiser. Neron, so whether yeah. you're taking it from the Latin or from the Greek, um, but yeah, well, let's, let's see where they go with it. Um, I'd like to see them do something with, uh, with 616 um, mention it or something like that. You support oh. arts is rhetorical goals. I think that's the main <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got you, Dan. Uh, you're talking about the whole IE and P source debate uh, for Genesis. Okay. So we're into the, the, the documentary hypothesis now. Um, what, what was he? So suggesting uh, the, the is it just me or is the majority of the Septuagint a story of how IE and P were struggling for dominance over the Semitic okay. peoples? That makes more um, sense. Yeah, by, by the Septuagint, uh, everything had kind of coalesced. Um, and so I don't think you see much movement, much variation in um, uh, J, E, P, uh, or D by that time period. But I personally am not a fan of J and E. I would side with the Europeans and a handful of American scholars who suggest that J and E were not full documentary sources, but are just fragments that uh, of P or post-P traditions. And so I, I refer to D, I refer to P, and then pre-P or post-P. Uh, but I don't know that they are, I, I don't know that there's a struggle for dominance or anything going on there. I, I think those are, were written to serve specific rhetorical goals uh, in four different groups in different time periods. For instance, P probably was really only in circulation among priests and priest adjacent groups before, you know, whenever this happened, fifth, fourth, third, second century BCE, where it gets democratized and spread out to everybody. Uh, so I think there's still a lot more work to do there, but um, I don't know that they were originally written to a, as part of a struggle for dominance so much as just to Is that you, Imus, again? Or yeah, we lost your audio again, and now we've got uh, we've got this repetitive. Oh <laughs> uh, man, are you familiar with Stephen D. Young? Stephen D. Um, I know a Stephen Young. Um, I know a, a, a Stephen De Jong. Um, I don't think I know Stephen De Young. Okay, so I'm I'm pulling it up here. Author, author of God is a Man of War and Religion of the Apostles from Ancient Faith Publishing. I am not familiar um, with this individual. They have a PhD in Biblical Studies from Amridge University. I'm not not familiar with Amridge University either. Is my audio huh. back or no? Yes, your audio is okay. back. Um, Vittershins, it's called Merism, M-E-R-I-S-M, Merism. 
it's sort of like soup to nuts, A to Z. Like when you say the, the top and the bottom of something and then you're encompassing all the things between that. Um, sort of like a literary device. And since that's kind of what I do, I get those types of questions a lot about those and their function. And... Right. Um, I guess we can get back into my questions finally. <laughs> Your mind bringing up Dr. Higashi's that's came up recently. Yes, mayorisms about good and evil in relation to Isaiah forty five seven. I think like I the Lord create all these things like mm, yeah calamity. But uh, and, and a lot of people are saying, oh, it's calamity. It's and, and I'm explaining how I don't think I don't think that there's really a. a a difference there like the word for calamity is very specific separate hebrew word from that evil but you could like the both my point was that i thought that the verbs are the issue because it's bara and i never say this right yatsar 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 yeah. um that like the, the both of the verbs are in that verse so what is that god can create out of nothing only god can bara and Yotzer is something that's created out of something that's pre-existing. So that's what like the whole comment section was like going nuts. <laughs> like all this stuff. And I and I that like people were saying, well, it says God makes evil. And I was like, no, I think it's saying that God created these good things and then evil was created out of them because of the fall. Um well, that's just my I don't know if that's accurate yeah. or not, but <laughs> Linguistically speaking, that was my apologetic response to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a bit about the exile. Um, yeah. Because they're, they're pretty established in the homeland. They've got the temple. They've got the ark. They're, they're all good. Um, and then suddenly they get, they get the boot and their temple is destroyed and they lose the ark. <laughs> Um, so they have to convince themselves that God is still with them somehow. Um, what, what do you think? And of course, when they, they get back and they intermingle with uh, the Persians and things, you know, kinds of wonky, then what do you think? How do you think the exile changed there? Uh, I know they became more monotheistic when they got back. Um, what do you think happened during that ex exilic period? Like they had to rely on like uh, oral tradition um, in order to keep their beliefs and doctrines and whatever alive. Uh, so what, I, I guess I'll say, what, what do you think? Uh, I'm so bad at this. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll ask this. What do you think Judaism would have looked like, or at least the Israelites concept of deity would look like had, had they stayed um, in Israel. Um, how do you think it would have changed versus how it changed since they got kicked out and they had, we, they were forced to. Are we in numbers? Is that what you're talking about? No. Oh, okay. No, I think, I'm, I don't think we're talking about a specific text. Isaiah, just, uh, Jeremiah. The time period. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that was awkward. <laughs> Um, that's an interesting question. So a little bit of counter, counterfactual history that, um, would be interesting to think about it. So yeah. some of the thing, the main things, experiment. yeah, yeah. Um, some of the main things that happened during the exile, like, like I mentioned, their, oh. their, their concept of deity changed, uh, because they were no longer in their own land and they needed to find a way to get Adonai, um, or their sovereignty to stretch beyond uh, the land of Israel. So I think you would not have that universalization that you do as a result of the exile. I think you would not have the pantheon reduction. You probably wouldn't have uh, quite as much of a concern for uh, worship only of Adonai. You probably would have more divine images going on, and particularly if you don't have the destruction of the temple. So if we're just talking about maybe the temple is destroyed, but they stay, then I think you pro you might still have some of this renegotiation of how divine images are, are understood and, and interacted with. But if you don't even have the destruction of the temple, then the first temple is still around and whatever images may have been there 
um, are still around. And so you probably have divine images still. And so they probably would have looked an awful lot like the, a lot of the other nations around them. So their, their uniqueness and their exclusivity and some of that ethnocentrism, I think, probably would not have developed. So it would have been a very different um, Judah that would have approximated much more closely probably your your Moab or um, some of the other secondary states that uh, had developed around them. And I don't know if they would have been able to survive as a result once you get the Persians coming through and then the Greeks, because I think one of the things that facilitated their survival as a distinct ethnic group was precisely those firm boundaries that they drew up in response to the pressures of the exile. So we may not have any understanding of, uh, of Judaism uh, anymore, but you know, the, the, those are just kind of uh, speculations. We yeah. <laughs> can't really know for sure what would have happened. Um, oh, she back. What happened? I have yeah, no fun. idea. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm making um, an album. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Dan, I didn't tell you. You usually the show runs in for two hours, but if you need to dip out early, no, I think I think I'll be okay. Okay, all right. Um, I want to get into the Yahweh's messenger. Okay. Um, because this is something that, where, where is it? Um, G Genesis eight, Jacob refers to the messenger who rede redeemed me from evil. Joshua, Joshua, uh, calls him the commander of Yahweh's hosts. Um, uh, yeah, uh, he's called the messenger of Yahweh in a bunch of other texts. Um, yeah, I just said that part. Yeah, so you, you got God is being described as this messenger, and there, there's there's it it kind of splinters off into all these different like sub factions of Yahweh. It kind of seems like uh, like some of them some of these messengers possess the divine name of Yahweh. So some of them don't. Some of them are, are independent, but some of them still claim the same power. Uh, so it's it's kind of all over the place. Um, yeah. What, what, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think we can, we can start with a Ugaritic conceptualization of, of uh, messengers. You have in, in Hebrew, it's malach in um, <laughs> lovely heart. Yeah. Um, in Ugaritic, you have divine messengers as well. Only they go back and forth between the gods. They don't have anything to do with communication with humans. Uh, and so in the early Hebrew Bible, you don't really have much going on in terms of divine messengers. And I have argued to some degree and, and will argue in um, forthcoming book that the, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> the concept of the messenger of Adonai, the angel of the Lord, is a product of textual interpolation, where at some point God's personal physical interactions with humanity become um, theologically uncomfortable. And it could be because it conflicts with this uh, rhetorical campaign to exalt God above the gods of the surrounding nations. And since these gods are gigantic gods and gods that you know are inaccessible and um, are dangerous, well, we've got to make our deity more inaccessible and dangerous, not the kind of deity who sits down next to the campfire and chats with you, as we see in some places. And so the passages where that's going on, the messenger becomes kind of a, a textual utility. We're going to use, we're going to just put the word malak in there right before God's name, and we're going to create the messenger of um, Adonai, and this will be this kind of intermediary. This will be the way that we say this is not actually God. This is someone who is this is this deity that's kind of functioning like a divine image, and it's presencing God, but God is actually off in heaven or somewhere else. And so that the messenger is not a very common entity, 
until we get these places where the messenger has been interpolated. And now this is a, an important entity. In fact, this is an entity that can say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God, uh, the God of Jacob. This is an entity that identifies with God and, and can wield um, divine power and authority. And I would suggest that it's after you get that interpolation and you get the creation of the angel of the Lord that angels then take on a new sense of significance and then begin to proliferate. Uh, but when we look back at the Hebrew Bible and like the the entity that says uh, to Joshua, I'm the captain of the Lord's host, there's nothing in the text that identifies that as an angel. But we look back at it and we say, everybody who's not God is an angel. And that's part of the much later exilic kind of demotion of all the deities down to the lowest divine tier, down to the servile class of angel. So things like seraphim, the ophanim, uh, the cherubim, all these entities are never identified as angels in the text, but they get shoved down with everybody else. And so now we think of them all as angels. I like to make the joke that uh, the only reason Christians are monotheists is because they call them angels and demons instead of lesser gods. And, you know, in... <laughs> And they are called gods in some places. Uh, and Qumran, for instance, refers to them as uh, as gods. But but yeah, that's it's just a renegotiation of their title. It's their job description. It's not. Um, it doesn't change their nature or their roles all that much. <laughs> and so the the angel of the Lord becomes this significant figure who can be used to do a lot of things where originally it was God doing these things, but but as I argue in the book, that probably originated just in textual interpolation. And, and I'm thinking about writing a book um, on, you know, the invention of the angel of the Lord or something like that, talking about where this figure came from. But the, the conceptual framework, the idea of this entity that can presence the deity is basically just taking the logic of divine images and saying, well, now we have a sentient anthropomorphic entity that is going to function in the exact same way that divine images function. So you have in, in Exodus 23, God saying, I will send my angel before you uh, to guide you along the way. Don't disobey him. Um, don't piss him off because he doesn't have to forgive your sins because my name is in him. And that's a way to say, I have endowed this angel with the divine name. Therefore, this angel um, presences, you know, um, manifests my presence, bears my authority, can even say, as the angel is supposed to say in Exodus 3, 6, I am the God of your fathers. And so that's um, what I would argue is the, the point where they're trying to rationalize what's going on here. So somebody interpolated the angel. The angel becomes this significant figure. We've got to account for how this angel can be both God and not God. And we'll use the concept of the, the possession of the divine name as the, the rationalization for that. And that ultimately, that would be the foundation for later having another anthropomorphic sentient entity, both identifying with God and as not God, namely Jesus Christ. So... I, I think it all um, accumulates and contributes to the same kind of trajectory. And he even gives the divine name to Moses. He says, you will, you will be God to them as I am God to you. And forget Right. So, so Exodus 7.1, I'll make you God, a God to Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And we also have when he's coming down from the mountain, he's got rays of light or horns of light coming off of his face, which is a very divine uh, feature. What were you saying, Ina? Um, you talk about in the book the cognitive schema of like the body as a container. Um, it's interesting. I just as I'm listening to you talk about this, sort of like they inflate the God concept, this like separate thing that's like above all things, and then we have all these containers that we're sticking them in: prophets, angels, messengers, like all these things. So even though we 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 raised the God the deity concept above that. We still have to like go back to like putting in the container. That yeah, realize anything because because so we've got up. we've got competing interests that we're trying to to respond to. On the one hand, we want God to be higher, but on the other hand, we still want God to be able to answer our prayers. We still want God to be able to 
care about us. And so we've got to do both things. We've got to, you know, shove God in the heavens, but we still got to figure out a way to make God's presence and power manifested on earth. Um, and so it's, we've got a lot of competing interests wrangling for our reflective um, efforts. And so, yeah, that it gets messy. And then at some point that people look back and say, all right, we're going to kind of tie all this together. And, and that's, um, where we get all these theological principles that that um, that some have stood the test of time, some have not. The Trinity being um, one good example of everybody looking back and going, you know, let's figure out how to um, how to distill this down to something we can all agree on. Um, the, that like section of your book was like one of the first things I started like highlighting frantically <laughs> because we talked about like you know, like. It, it, like infant cognition and like how we have this like container idea and like in and out and like object permanence and stuff from mm -hmm. a holistic standpoint when we're looking at neurotypical development whatever that really means anymore right um we don't have to explain part whole like explicitly it's just sort of like mapped out for children and we we find the contrast of this in neurodivergent groups where you have to explicitly teach part whole. And when I say that, I try to think of like a pitcher of lemonade, like a glass pitcher, mm -hmm. where we just say pitcher when we put it down and the brain sort of knows the whole thing is the pitcher. And then we could say clear and transparent and glass and lemon and liquid and all the things inside of it. And it's just understood where there are entire systems of language learning for people who are children with language impairments and whatever have you where you explicitly teach part whole. So it's interesting how you find the same sort of, you know, cognitive leap and linguistic leap in the context of like, you know, you said like creating deity and like, what do they mean and how do we talk about them? The same yeah. thing happens to a child as they learn to talk. And, and one of the things I argue about constantly is how, you know, human beings are like really the only species on the planet that demonstrate like this complex linguistic behavior certainly other before everyone comments freaks out <laughs> animals communicate and that's what i'm saying right right <laughs> because that you know as far as we understand the way that yeah. our language works and what they do aren't necessarily language um but yeah that's that's, that's like i got to that page i was like <laughs> the highlighter came out i was like ah. yeah and and um neurodivergent folks frequently have to kind of consciously curate their social interactions as well, because right. that's something that for neurotypical folks is, is pretty intuitive and is pretty right. built in these, right. these social interactions. And, um, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if you've ever, or is that, a, is that being sarcastic there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, okay, I'm, severe, okay. <laughs> I'm severe ADHD. Okay. All right. So yeah, my, um, and, yeah, we all know some folks who have to kind of, you know, consciously, oh, I'm doing this with my face now to signal to this person that, you know, I sympathize or I understand or, or I don't understand and things like that. So, yeah, I, I and interestingly enough, it's neurodivergent folks and folks who have injuries and things like that who kind of help us better understand yes. what is neuro, what is typical and what is not. Um, and, and I think some of those most fascinating insights into how our brain works have come from examples of folks who have had injuries or who um, are neurodivergent. Yeah, I work primarily with adults who have lots of different injuries, primarily cancer. Um, mm. But what's interesting is in adulthood, the last thing to leave is sort of the social and pragmatic aspects of communication. So what happens is they, when um, other healthcare providers, nurses or doctors interact with these individuals, um, they have a, they, they think that their language and their cognition is intact because they're able to mask it through these social you know, cues, these sort of um, scripted things that we say, like the kind of the joke of like, you go to the airport and the tax driver says, have a good flight. And you say, you too. You too, like, yeah. Plane, right? It's they very reflexive. Things. Yes, it's reflexive. Yeah. They keep these things. But as soon as you say, what's this? And they can't get the word cup out. You realize that they're, they're two separate behaviors that are intermingled later on in life. We pick up yeah. that special thing yeah. first. So. All right. Got a good question. Thank you again, uh, Michael19. Hi, Michael. Super chat. Uh, from an academic perspective, what do you think about Christian apologists versus Jewish counter missionaries arguments? Uh, I mean, like, 
<laughs> Rabbi Tobias Singer type. Um, yeah, because I think of, I, I'm aware of some like um, Torah observant people who use that language of, of counter missionary argument, but I don't know that that's um, what you're talking about there. So counter missionaries. But I tend to not. Um, <laughs> I think there are there are issues with both sides of of um, apologetic arguments, and I've said in the past. However, uh, I, I try to put the data first whenever possible. But all other things being equal, I will give the benefit of the doubts to the less powerful group. And so, when it comes to arguments between Christian apologists and Jewish counter missionaries. Uh, I would probably give the benefit of the doubt to Jewish counter missionaries, although I think there are probably um, lots of dogmas that are governing uh, both of their arguments. And so I would also have to take that on a case by case basis. But um, yeah, but I'm not I'm not incredibly well informed about the precise details of this. Yeah, If, if we're talking about guys like Rabbi Tobias Singer, um, his. Criticisms mm -hmm. of the New Testament and church history are, are very, very solid. I have both of his books, uh, Let's Get Biblical. I love them to death. They're, they're great. Uh, but he also believes he's a direct descendant of Aaron. He believes he's <laughs> years old. He, he believes the, the Exodus literally happened. So he's very good at explaining what is what is happening in the in the Torah and the Jewish law and, and their history and everything. Uh, and he's very good at saying, like, when Paul says this, he's taking it out of context and he's changing words. Um, it's, that, should it's very, a, very that should be a game. Like, every time you hear taking out of context, like, something should happen. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, what context and what's being taken out? It's, like, such yeah. a annoying... Paul, Paul doesn't just take verses yeah. out of context. He, like, ch he'll, like, change one or two words. Um, like, so it means something else completely. Um, like, uh, what is it, the... I'm, I'm drawing a blank now. Um, it's about sacrifice and atonement. Um, the not the wages of sin is death. Um, yeah. Anyway, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> um, thank you for the super chat, Justin. Uh, if angel of was an interpolation, what do we need to reconcile the AOTL as God and not God? Doesn't the fact that if it was interpolated, render the conceptual framework explaining it unnecessary. Uh, I think that, well, uh, people are going to want to try to explain it, uh, whether it was an interpolation or not. People argue about the nature of the angel of the Lord uh, in a lot of different uh, texts. In fact, I, I, in the book, I point out there are three different main theories. One is the um, hypostasis theory that the angel is some kind of um, hypostasis of God. One is the what I call the representative theory, which is the idea that the angel is um, kind of like a modern legal representative where they have the ability because they are a representative to speak on behalf of their patron and, and to act on behalf of the patron. Another is the ambiguity theory. This is um, something that um, particularly Michael Hundley um, and a couple others have argued for, which is the idea that the intent is to obscure the nature of God's presence, to disincentivize people from using these appearances as uh, declarations of God's physical nature and things like that. And then the interpolation theory is the one um, that I prefer. So I think there's always utility and having an explanatory framework for this, but it also helps us to understand the development of the concept. And because the later texts uh, treat the angel as this separate entity, uh, I think it's important to, to understand when that kind of conflated identity is being evoked and when it's not. Uh, but having that explanation also helps us uh, explain development of early Christology also helps us explain uh, how the logic of divine images informs uh, how the biblical texts come together. So in my book, I talk about how because the angel is rationalized as identified with God in virtue of being endowed with the divine name, we later have the text of the Torah, which has the divine name inscribed upon it. 
being conceptualized as its own species of divine image, that the text itself can manifest God's presence and power. And there are a bunch of different ways that that, ha that, that happens. Uh, down to, in the Persian period, we get Mezuzot and Tefillin, which contain um, the little rolled up texts with portions of the Torah that include the divine name as a kind of democratized, personalized species of divine image. And they're used in ways that, for instance, standing stones and other divine images were used anciently, for instance, to put it on the, the doorpost of the house is exactly what folks would do with divine images anciently. You would put a big steely at the gate of the city or you would have your little teraphim or whatever the nature of personal divine images was in uh, the first millennium BCE near the door of your house. And so mezuzot in that sense are taking that renegotiated concept of, of divine images and personalizing it and then allowing an individual to do the same things that they were doing earlier. But this time in a world where we reject idols and divine images. So I think it's important to understand that that um, explanation because it helps us explain other things that are going on that are related. Yeah. Um, real quick, someone thinks I was crazy because it was driving me nuts. Uh, what I was talking about earlier is Hebrews nine twenty two, where uh, Paul says, "Without uh, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin." Mm. Uh, he's he's misquoting Leviticus seventeen eleven, where it says, "For it is by it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement." Um, he's talking about the uh, the altar, and in Leviticus, he's being um, they're being forbidden from consuming the blood on the altar because the blood right. is alive. So Paul right. is misrepresenting that. Anyway, just had to redeem myself there. My little redemption arc. Um, so you have. Uh, I, I think we'll start to wrap things up with uh other quote that I think summarizes things really well that you have in your book. 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 You're doing that thing again. Well now we know where the audio is coming from. Oh man. Okay. Uh because deities are not unique categories that occur in nature, there is no acid into which we can dip the text to see if deity is present. They are constructed and curated by individual cognition, by, cult, uh, by cultural evolution, and by social institutions, which means the most direct answer to the question posed by the title of this book, What is Deity?, is rather simple, if a bit disappointing. A deity is whatever a group, of, uh, is whatever a group says a deity is. Well, yeah, I read that. I was like, "That's that's beautiful. That's just <laughs> so simple and so well written." Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's um, that's something that I I, I first wrote uh, in my dissertation. I was uh, the second chapter I wrote was on the concept of religion, and I wrote a whole chapter on why I was not using the concept of religion in the dissertation, and I was applying the same cognitive linguistic principles to how we understand categories, uh, specifically religion, and came to the same uh, kind of conclusion that most definitions of conceptual categories are about trying to reduce a conceptual category to a short list of necessary and sufficient features. And I spent 10,000 words and uh, arguing that the only necessary and sufficient feature that is common to all things that have been labeled religion and only common to all things that have been labeled religion is that they have been labeled religion. In other words, a religion is whatever somebody says is a religion. And the only question is who agrees with them and who doesn't. And the same is true of, of deity. We can't really reduce it to uh, a short list of necessary and sufficient features. And yeah, a deity is, is whatever a group agrees is a deity. And that's how language works, uh, which I think is one of the more fascinating insights from uh, cognitive linguistics. Uh, I miss, uh, I'm, I'm sorry you missed as I was starting to get into cognitive linguistics. And uh, I heard you. Um, oh, just, you can hear me. Though. Okay. I apologize sincerely for the technical difficulty. Okay, no worries. Um, 
Yeah, and and so I think when we when we try to figure out what's going on with deity in in the Hebrew Bible, we do no justice to the text, like I said, or like you read at the beginning of the of the live live stream, to just um, uncritically import our own concepts of what deity is. We have to take it for whatever they say it is, and and that's not a that's not a definition that is very handy, but I think it is one that is more accurate and. Yeah, that a lot of people get frustrated with uh, with me when they say, well, how do you define it? And I say, I don't define it. You can't define it. And they're like, yeah, I can. And I'm like, no, that's not. Please your... say you like forever so I can watch it. Like, every... <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, constantly yeah. explaining sort of like my my major like thing is language doesn't possess, 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 doesn't possess. Wow. You you we lost you again. <laughs> I I want to hear what she uh what she has to say though but but I agree. Yeah, I assume she's going to say something about language not possessing inherent meaning that that meaning is a product of uh, a social convention or something like that, but I'd like to hear what she has to say. Um Yeah. Um he, Hebrew, sorry, real quick. Um, yeah, I, I said Paul, the author of Hebrews. That's an old habit. Church <laughs> taught me that Paul's the author of Hebrews, and I didn't learn any better. So it's I'll, I'll say that still from time to time. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> um, she, she was back for a second. All right, well, yeah, it seems to be happening. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but you wanted to hear what she had to say. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I want to hear what um, what she has to say. But yeah, that's a soapbox of mine because, and this happens all the time on Twitter. People who do not know who I am, uh, or I'm like, you know, here's something about deity, about religion, about racism, about um, whatever, and they're like, "Well, how do you define it?" I'm like, "I do not define it." And then they're like, "Oh, you don't know what you're talking about." Like, yeah. on the contrary, how do you define it? I've published on this. You're the one who doesn't <laughs> know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, that's I. Once I got heavy into cognitive linguistics and started working as a linguist, um, trying to engage online debates became so much more frustrating. <laughs> oh, I couldn't imagine. Um, okay, hang on. I, I think we got a clarification of Justin's question. What I meant was, if it was interpolated, doesn't that make all of the later conflations of the angel of the Lord and Adonai theologically unsound? Well, theologically unsound is um, is kind of outside of, of the scope of my um, academic interests, but it would absolutely make it a renegotiation. I don't think we're in a position, I don't think the data can help us determine which position is closer to any external reality. Uh, I would, I kind of approach all of these texts as equally theologically unsound. Um, so yeah, all of the texts are representing a specific author's conceptualization of what's going on out there. And so I reject just as a matter of principle, any assumption that any one perspective actually comports with uh, with any kind of theological reality. But yeah, the, there is no authoritative deployment of the of the Bible in my perspective that is not a renegotiation of something that was different in a previous iteration or in a previous generation. Everybody is is reading it within their own circumstances and according to their own lenses to meet their own needs. So yeah, and it's probably not incredibly helpful for you, but um, but that's how you, I approach it. You're approaching the data as a as a historian. Right? Yeah, I yeah. I can't as a historian. You can't say which idea of about God is more correct than the other because everyone has the same claim or the same amount of data to back up their claim. Everyone's just yeah. making educated guesses based off of events around them, essentially. Yeah, and and theology in that regard is is a lot like language in that theological claims are only legitimate to the degree that people agree they're legitimate. There's no way to empirically show any of that. Um, and so, yeah, when there are a lot of folks who 
And then this is an interesting thing about online discourse. A lot of folks argue based on the knowledge that there are enough people out there that already agree with a given dogma. And so a lot of arguments happen on this, more people agree with my dogma, so my dogma is accepted kind of level. But uh, I try to cut through that and say, I, I don't accept dogmas, period. If you want to make a claim, provide the data. And it is, I think, a lot of people have never had to, never been called out on a claim that, a dogmatic claim that, you know, so many people accept. They've never had to mm-hmm. provide any data for it. And they're completely unable to. Um, so, yeah, and <laughs> the world would be a different place if uh, if people had to provide uh, backup evidence data for all of their claims. It would take a lot longer to get through arguments, though. It would. Um, Imus actually texted me what she was going to tell you. Um, okay. She said, language doesn't possess cor- correctness. It is arbitrary in nature and can only contain the meaning of uh, a group has decided to give it to that meaning changes as the function of that word or any syn- syntactic convention or phrasing or yeah, phrasing has humans use language in an environment full of dangers and censorship where words can be weapons or heal. Uh, language is and always will be complex tool. And I agree. We can't define these things with a certainty, just as we can't uh, guess which tool we need until we confront what needs to be fixed. That's yeah, very excellent. Cool. Yeah. Really well said. Goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree completely. It's all it's meaning is situationally emergent and it's based on our understanding of widespread agreements about what associations we are going to agree are exist between certain combinations of sounds and certain semantic content and that can change from situation to situation from person to person from time to time from place to place Uh, a story i always tell is about how my first week in oxford was a little frustrating because how I spoke the same language, but I had trouble understanding a lot of people. And I was in uh, on Corn Market Street, this um, this kind of foot traffic retail district in downtown Oxford. And I saw a KFC, and I was like, "Awesome!" Oh, so I went in <laughs> KFC and was like, "Do you have biscuits?" And they were like, "Why would we have biscuits?" <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right. Biscuits means cookies here." Okay. Well, what I want is. I have no idea how to describe what I'm looking for precisely. And I tried, and it reminds me of this old kids in the hall sketch where a guy was like, what pray tell is a craw? And the guy's like, well, it's about this. I saw one when I was in Paris. <laughs> and gets really frustrated. And, and um, that's that was me. I was like, it, it, doughy, it's flaky, layers, butter. And, and they were like, mm, no, no. And I, I should have said, do you have scones? That's not what I understand a scone to be, but um, but that would have been they would have understood, and they still would have told me why on earth would we have scones because they they don't eat the, the biscuits over there. So I went across the street to Burger King, but <laughs> that's because the Just language, yeah, the it possesses no inherent meaning. It is all based on the experiences that we accumulate with those agreements, we observe those agreements taking place. And then we go, oh, okay, I can participate in this agreement as well. But another group over here has a completely different set of agreements. Um, and so it's always situationally emergent. So yeah, that's, and so I got a more story. Yeah. Um, when I was in college, I was a part of a ministry that helped um, Chinese students learn English by reading the Bible as you do. Uh, so I'd, I'd go there and he'd, he'd be reading and it, this guy I was with, he, he read pretty good. He like, All right, my, my, my job is going to be easy tonight. Um, so he, he got to the word spirit and he was like, what is spirit? And I was like, <laughs> it's spirit, man. What, what do you mean? What is it? I, like, I, I don't, I've never had to explain spirit to another human being before. And I didn't know what to do. Yeah. So I called my teacher over who uh, who did speak Chinese. And she was like, "Oh, it's it's this." And he was like, "Oh, okay, okay." Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just do that. Just then, Can you teach me. <laughs> yeah, 
they did there was just a gloss it was just yeah. the the equivalent word in in their language i want to respond to a couple things real quick has dan read wittgenstein yes um because he says the the same thing about uh game he says can you i don't remember exactly what the translation is can you um outline a game uh no you've never had to before but that has never stopped you from using the word and so think about that. Can you define game off the top of your head? Um, I would argue that that's another word you cannot define uh, adequately, but we all know what a game is. Um, and then um, wait, Dan takes KFC and Burger King over a good old fish and chips <laughs> or a kebab. Yes, because I had been there a week and we were staying at a um, at the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies. That's where I lived when I did my master's degree there. And at the time, it's not anymore, but at the time it was located in Yarnton Manor, which is a manor estate about five miles outside of Oxford in the country in a little village, not even a city. It was a village. It might have even have been a hamlet called Yarnton. And there were two pubs nearby, one called the Red Lion, which I think is the most popular pub name in all of um, Great Britain. And the other was called the Turnpike. And I had eaten there so many times, I was really looking forward to some good old fashioned KFC biscuits by that yeah. time. So, um, yeah, the yeah. food and I had a, um, a sordid relationship in the UK. I am not a big fan of a lot of, of UK food. And also, I am allergic to seafood and hate the taste of seafood as well. So, um, but I had been having other, other pub fare. Um, all right. It's a little after nine. I've got to be up in six hours, uh, to drive into work. So I should probably, um, wrap up now if that's okay with you all. I'm sorry to, to cut Probably out. Of you never come on in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would love to be able to hang out longer and continue to talk. You've got a great audience and, um, and it's been great to talk to y'all, but, um, but I am going to have to go before my kids come in here and drag me away. <laughs> absolutely well thanks again uh for joining us thank you chat for the steady flow of questions when i was struggling to find some uh, something to ask um but this is fun uh, yeah thank done. you and um dan's for everybody book. what's that read dan's book <laughs> yeah i was i was gonna say i've got the book you Link can buy welcome. hard copies if you want however you can also just read it for free uh the pdf is freely available and um I spoke with the publishers uh, at this big conference I was at last month. Uh, I've had a number of folks reach out, and particularly from the disability community, asking about an audio version. Yeah. And I am in talks with the publisher to produce an open access audio version of the book as well. So I don't know how that's going to go, but the discussion has started. So for those who, who would appreciate uh, an audio version, I am working on that. So um, I did want to make sure I, I let everybody know about that. That would be okay. great. I yeah. feel sorry for the guy who's going to read. That's going to be me. <laughs> oh, <you? laughs> yeah. Oh, that yeah. wouldn't be so bad then. Well, we'll see. Um, I know, I know Seth Andrews really struggled with Dr. Josh Bowen's book. <laughs> we can like text him regularly. How do you pronounce this? How do you pronounce this? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Funny. yeah. Um, all, right, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate um the invitation and the opportunity and your time and attention and uh a lot thank of great you. questions. Yeah. Thank you so all much. Have, all right. Y'all have a great night. Hold on to your butts.